and today is a Monday. Monday is normally a very exciting day, based on the facts. That Monday is the selected day for each of the sales marketing trading companies within the GTI group. Therefore, there's going to be a lot of people coming in to this boardroom here today. And many of these individuals have been selected and requested to speak for up to two minutes on a specific subject working within role, their working role within the GTI group. The reasons and purpose for this film is basically, one, to record a milestone in the growth and the history of the GTI group. Secondly, for us all to see ourselves as others see us. Hopeful we may learn something from this. Thirdly, to familiarise ourselves with that which I can only describe as a major revolution in the film recording equipment. The videotape, which I intend to introduce into the GTI group for the benefit of us all, for us all to use for, as example, further education, that insight uh, situation. <coughs> Therefore, the thirdly, sorry, thirdly of course, for us all to gain the experience are speaking in front of the camera and therefore can be relied upon it perhaps at a later date to compile a film or document a film to be used within the segments of the GTI or within the general group of the GTI in general. Therefore to get the ball rolling I'll now bring us slightly up to date of how we stand as a company as of today's date the 16th of August 1982. We are indeed a group of companies <coughs> that's an indication as one, two, three. We have a window company. We have a kitchen company. We have a roofing company. Could you please keep the door close one? So <coughs> within ideally within each of these companies we have a general manager. Each of these general managers, of course, has quite a large team. As an example, this window company, the general manager has a sales manager. The sales manager has his sales force. Also within this tier, this structure, we have an accounts manager, a contracts manager, as known within the GTI group. And the contracts manager has his assistant and also is supervisor. And the supervisor has obviously his fixing team, the fixers. Also within this tier we have the accounts manager which is now accounts payable and accounts receivable. And last but not least of course we have the factory manager. Within the factory manager we have, of course, all the factory hands and fabricators. <coughs> Actually, within this tier, each company has a very similar process, if not the same, as this structure which we have just here. The only difference being that within the roofing structure, we have our South Australian operations and our Victorian operations in Melbourne. But they each have a very same similar tier as that which we have here. A major part of the success within the GTI group, of course, has been this type of formation. Whereas we can have a communication system, a communication by way of regular constructive meetings. We have, of course, our sales meetings, we have our fixers meetings, we have our management meetings, we have our group meetings, and we also have what we call now a board of directors meeting. Here we have a group manager and here we have your jolly old loyal servant the managing director <coughs> the structure which we have here at these meetings is to convey constructive improvements throughout the company therefore it's very advantageous if at these regular constructive meetings if either individual as of course a constructive criticism maybe <laughs> or constructive improvement within the group to make sure of course it is duly edited in the minutes, by the minute secretary, at the regular constructive meetings. Therefore, you will find that whatever the subject is, it will be discussed, no doubt, at board level. This is just 
One of the stages that the GTI group is going through at this present stage, on the 16th of August, 1982. Our group manager, Mr. Len Lowen, will now explain to us the actual group involvement of each individual company. The GTI group consists, as, as has already been explained, three individual trading companies, GTI Decretalers, GTI Aluminium, and GTI Kitchens. These three companies share a common management structure, they share common premises here at Holden Hill and also at our Grange Road Allenby Gardens display centre premises, and they also share a common set of aims and objectives. Sharing these common facilities in this fashion is aimed at minimising the individual overhead of each organisation, whilst maximising the opportunities for each company within the group to make profit and in turn the opportunity for them to expand further, to grow further. Group management, in effect, consists of Colin Davies and I myself as group manager. We provide the financial, the accounting, the sales and marketing background skills and experience to the group as a whole. Our role is to provide assistance to all of the individual management of these companies wherever possible. It was envisaged from the very start that whilst all of the personnel involved within the group would have their own individual areas of responsibilities to their own one company as such, in involvement would be mutual by all staff to the other operations right the way across the group, where they would each individual manager, whether they be people involved in aluminium, decretales or kitchens, would share their experiences, give whatever assistance was possible automatically to the other units within the group. How can then we all, working within the group, look at fostering this further involvement with the other operations? Well, firstly, we all need to be aware of the products and service offered by the other companies within the group, taking an interest in what they're doing at all times. We should be keeping our eyes and ears open for all opportunities to advise our own clients, if we have roofing clients, that aluminium exists and what it does, kitchens exist and what it does as such. We should be contra contributing towards group personnel meetings held here once a month via the chairman of SAME for any suggestions that can be made for improving the group as a whole, the way we operate our policies and procedures. And we should be offering suggestions and advice we may have about marketing the image of the group as a whole at all times. Finally, we should all in turn contribute the maximum we possibly can by way of sales income to the company, which in turn gives us the profit that allows us to continue to grow, continue to build a solid and dependable image to the public of South Australia. In 1978, Decromastic Roofing System was marketed throughout Australia by ACI Fiberglass. November 1978 saw the formation in Melbourne, Australia of AHI Roofing, Australia Proprietary Limited, established as AHI New Zealand's own marketing arm for the product here in Australia. Following four to five months of intensive groundwork on their behalf, AHI Roofing decided upon embarking upon a franchising network system throughout Australia, giving sales rights to the product to individual franchisees in states and areas. GTI at that stage, very much going through its growth process, recognised the potential for the use of the product here in South Australia and took on one of a number of franchises at that time. With further growth and recognition of our aim to maximise our independence and uh, control over our own destiny, it was decided that in July 1981 we would form GTI Decretalis Proprietary Limited as an individual company that would have a prime number one objective of gaining state distributorship of the Decrebon product in as short a time as possible by way of maximum sales performance. Results by our sales force assured this aim would become reality and in March 1982, GTI Decretalers were appointed master distributors for the Decrebon roofing system here in South Australia. The time is opportune right now to remind ourselves of the aims and objectives on which this company of GTI Decretalers was founded and built. These base sales objectives were to promote and sell primary to any other the company's franchise Decrebon roofing product, Secondly, to maintain the company's position as being the number one Decrebon distributor in Australia through 81-82 tile sales budget of 150,000 units. Number three was to sell clear, profitable and as easily administrable contracts as possible. 
Number four, to achieve and exceed all duly set sales budgets on a regular basis. And finally, to establish an adequate percentage sales level in South Australia for AHI Roofing Australia to no longer require the maintenance or the presence of its own branch office in this state. I hand you over to the sales force. Hi, I'm John Langton, Products Manager of GTI Deck Patrollers. The purpose of my short discussion this morning or today is to talk about sales training meetings. Why should we have these? Time and time again we hear the expression of meetings, meetings, more damn meetings. Salesmen say it, I say it, management say it. However, we've got to look at the situation in regards to meetings. Meetings must be organised to serve a purpose. There must be an input by the person giving the meetings and an input and output by people who are there. Sales training is a very, very important step in towards the progress of each company and individual. I cite a situation where a person goes through some sort of trade or formality of learning some business. Let's take a carpenter, for instance. A young lad does an apprenticeship. He spends three, four or five years as an apprenticeship and he learns a trade. After he learns that trade, he goes out in the field and he continues on doing his business. However, through the course of doing his business, he must upgrade the standard of his workmanship look at new technologies in the improvements of houses and buildings. To do this, he must learn. How does he learn? He learns by practice out in the field. He also learns by reading magazines and brochures. He learns by other people. Now, let's look at salespeople. A salesman or a sales lady says, I am a salesperson. I can go out, I can sell that calculator, and I am good. However, once they've learned that trade, what do they do? They hide what they've learned in a drawer and say, I'm a salesperson. They put this little badge on and I'm great. Now, salespeople of all people detest sales meetings. And of all people, they ought to attend sales meetings because they're only fooling themselves and the companies they work for. Now, what I'm suggesting here today is that anybody involved in selling never ever knock up the opportunity to have, go to a sales meeting and never ever knock the opportunity to put something into it and to get something out of it because we're always there to learn and to learn the new techniques of selling the change of environment, the change of technology, the change of product, product knowledge, what a great thing to learn. How many salespeople who say, I know enough about that calculator? Do they know enough? Do we ever really know enough? We certainly don't. So therefore, what I'm saying to you all today is this, that when a program sales meeting is, is organized, please attend, please put something into it, you'll get something out of it. Because if you don't, you'll fall by the wayside by like Dino the dinosaur. He existed some years ago. He's not here today. You know why? Because he couldn't attune himself to the nature of the planet as we're changing. If we don't do that as people, then we won't attune ourselves and we'll die out like him. Self and roofing company presentation. I think this is a very important uh, aspect because when we think about it, when people are buying off you, they're actually putting their trust in you. And uh, that comes across in your, your own personal presentation and also the presentation of the company. Professionalism uh, enters into this very much. I think uh, the company and both uh, yourself have to be very professional in every aspect um, of the uh, roofing industry. Um, th that would come into uh, grooming, perhaps dress, um, as far as the individual goes, down to their things like cases, their cars, are these things, do these things put forward a professional attitude towards your, your job? On a company level, um, shall we say company grooming um, and it's the, the stationery that it uses um, the way in which its buildings are presented um, and those who are employed by the company uh, I think integrity and honesty are uh, some of the things that uh, come across in one's presentation and I think these also both on a self and company level should be um, maintained to a high degree because uh, this attitude eventually comes across, it'll either come across from the individual salespeople or it'll come across um, from the company attitude. Also a, uh, an interest and a respect for the client comes across in your uh, presentation. If you have a genuine interest in the client and uh, a respect for that person, then uh, that'll come across in your presentation. Once again, it comes across on a company level as well that this should be, throughout the whole organisation, people should be, uh, be able to appreciate that it is the client that provides our jobs, um, our satisfaction out of our jobs, 
the whole, everything that we've got is based around the client. And uh, that's really about it. There's not, there's a, quite, it's quite a big subject I'm supposed to talk about. I haven't had much time to prepare it. That's it. Uh, Graham Clark's my name. Uh, I'm the area manager for the Iron Triangle right down the Air Peninsula. My name's Nigel Nelson. I'm the area manager for Deckwood Tylers. Uh, the area I'm responsible for is the Upper South East. I've been asked by the company to give you a little bit of a rundown on the Deckwood Tile. In actual fact, it's called a tile, but it is part of an integral uh, roofing system, uh, an interlocking roofing system uh, comprising of a base product of steel. Now, the steel is coated with zinc and in turn is then coated with several protective coatings, starting with a bitumastic emulsion an acrylic hardener and finally the maintenance free natural stone chip on the surface of the tile. It is strong, it's uh, a very good profile, there's no crimps etc in the pressing. Uh, it's fixed by several methods, um, first of all starting with the battening system either for new roofing or re-roofing and it's installed by fixing with cadmium plated nails. The actual surface of the tile is coated with a natural stone which is quarried in various parts of New Zealand. They come in a variety of colours and are all natural colours, there's no um, actual paint or dyes used in the manufacture of the tile which makes it fade resistant. Um, the product is marketed right throughout Australia and in 60 countries throughout the world. It comes with a 25 year guarantee and is a manufacturer's guarantee which is backed by AHI, the roofing division of the ACI Industries. Thank right, you. My name's Neil Shear, I'm a sales technical agent for GTI Decretolis. My subject of discussion this morning is pitch book presentation. The way that I'd like to tackle the subject is by describing what I believe that pitch book should be used for and the way that I have mine set out to show people in the home exactly the type of work that we are prepared to do. First of all, of course, we start with uh, photos before and after of various jobs we've completed, not only with, with tiles, but with all products we use. We also have uh, illustrations and literature showing the methods of application. We really need uh, more total involvement within the, the pitch book during the presentation stage. All the information that you're passing on to the client can be shown visually as well as verbally. Uh, the visual presentation is much more important than the verbal. People will remember a photo if you talk about it for far longer than if you're just uh, discussing a particular aspect. If you can actually show them the way that things are prepared on the roof. The little things like putting the battens on, uh, the way they're done, the spacings that are, that are created, how it's done. Um, the methods of finishing off on flashing. These are some of the details which I believe we do need covered very much in, in the pitch book itself. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, there are the photos before and after of various jobs around town. One of the most important things is to be able to, to tell people exactly where they are. Uh, we have had cases where people need to go around to look at these jobs, and if you can't tell them exactly where they are, they think you're just using someone else's. So we need exact information of jobs we're actually doing. Uh, presentation of, uh, of the way that the fixer carries out the work is very important and if you can show uh, examples of the fixer at work doing his preparation and his finishing off of the tile we find that uh, uh, if the, the fixer is uh, dressed properly and uh, performing his duty correctly it comes over much better to the client and that's the type of person the client wants working around their own home. Other things uh, incorporating in the picture book of course is guarantees, not only your own guarantees but the guarantees that the opposition also offer and being able to distinguish between guarantee and warranty and showing them literally uh, the concept that's uh, available in the two types of guarantees and warranties. Also photos before and after, as many as possible, preferably to, to try to find one in there that is very similar to the, to the client's own home and I believe that, that is very important. And at this stage, that's a bit all I'd say. My name's Malcolm Weddell, I, uh, area manager for the Barossa Valley and up through the Riverlands. Uh, I want to talk a, a few words on what I call keeping it simple. First of all, I'd like to give a little bit of a, a joke first. I think it's a joke anyway. First, I thought it was. It was about a lawyer that was interviewing a woman regards divorce. 
He started off asking her different questions. Do you uh, have grounds? Yes, she says. A Hector. Hmm. Do you have a grudge? Uh, no, I've got a carport. Does he beat you up? No, I'm always awake first. Why do you want a divorce? Well, he's got no intelligent conversation. That little story shows you you shouldn't take for granted that people or the client understand exactly what you're trying to tell them. In fact, to some people, your presentation could sound like a foreign language, and to many potential clients, if you blind them with science, you've lost them altogether. I think the idea is to concentrate on the main facts. Present, presentation should be distinct and understandable, and then if the time comes to assess if more facts are necessary, then you go about it then. So just keep it simple. Right, did science. One of the sales force for DTI, Decretalers. My subjects, good salesman. What makes a good salesman? Well, the main thing is the ability to present your product and yourself in a manner where your customer or your client will accept you and accept you. The advantage of your product is another important aspect of it. Positive action being taken on all your jobs when you sign up the deal. The ability to be able to close the sale, to leave the customer happy and above all, not to walk away from the sale and leave the client there. Stay with them for 10 minutes, have a cup of tea, talk about something else, but make sure you leave that customer happy. After the sale's finished, after the job's completed, go back and see the customer as part of being the salesman. You must do that, and I think that's one of the main aspects of being a good salesman, but above all, your own credibility and your company's credibility and the product that you're selling. Is important. My name is Ken Graham. I'm the contracts manager from GTI Decretalis. Processable contracts requirements. We here at GTI Decretalis classify a processable order as number one. We read through the contract to do to to find out if the contract has been filled out properly. Example: the contract is here. Name, address, telephone number, plan, and the finances. We then see the starting date is processable within 14 days, then it gets entered into the sales ledger. From the sales ledger comes back to the contracts manager who then who then puts it into materials, schedules the materials and fixer to arrive on site. Then when the job is completed, the fixer then gets a acceptance form filled in and signed by the client to say that he is satisfied with the job then brings it into the office again, then we pay the contractor, we invoice the client, and hopefully the money comes in within seven days. That is a processful order from GTI Decatailers. I now will pass you on to Larry Thompson, who will speak to you with, about communications from sales to fixing. Thank you. Morning, my name is Larry Thompson. I'm Assistant Contracts Manager to Ken Graham. Uh, I'm here this morning to talk on communications from sales to fixing. Although communications from sales <coughs> personnel to fixers would normally take place through the contracts manager, I feel it is a good idea for a dialogue to exist between individual sales and fixing personnel. At some time in the past history of our company, there existed a fairly good relationship between some salespeople and some fixers. This relationship has deteriorated significantly over the past couple of years. I feel then that it would be a valuable exercise to attempt to rebuild that relationship to a meaningful level. A common complaint we often hear from the client is that once the sale has been made, the client rarely sees anybody except the fixer again. Therefore, I think it would be in the best interests of all concerned, that is the company, sales, fixers, and particularly the client, <coughs> for an effort to be made by the salesperson to visit the client while the job is in progress. In this way, with a sensible approach by both the salesman and fixer, some of the problems that occur could be discussed with the client and resolved before they create further problems. Finally, one further point I would like to make is that all relevant information pertaining to a contract 
should be given to the contracts manager to be passed on to the fixer. Lack of such information can often lead to unnecessary difficulties simply because no one is aware of them. Effective communication is essential to the smooth running and completion of a contract, and a minimum of problems is beneficial. Uh, my name's Bob Hunter. I work for GTI in the promotions or public relations team. My job mainly entails, um, well, basically just door knocking uh, on houses and speaking to people, being the first point of contact with the company. Um, I've been doing this for about 12 months and um, we've had a reasonable amount of success. Also I'm involved with the shopping centres, setting up the displays and taking the displays down. I also um, do country shows such as Cleve, Wyala and virtually um, well, try to create a good impression or I hope I do create a good impression as the first point of contact with the company. Um, basically I've just been canvassing uh, for use of a better word but um, I feel that uh, this is far more than canvassing in the approach I take, I try to take the professional. My personal task this morning is to very quickly in two minutes cover the uh, commencement of the company uh, it, from the time of inception to its establishment firmly as a market competitor. GTI Aluminium commenced operation on the 1st of January 1980 as a new division of Gold Temp Industries, then heavily established in insulation and re-roofing, and having realised that the window replacement market was expanding in the hands of very few professional competitors. In fact, there were only two others of any great note that were professionally working in the business. The basis of commencement was fairly simple and very sound. One salesman administrator and one installation team of two men both on subcontract, or shall I say all three on subcontract, were very easily accommodated within the office and administrative structure of Gold Temp Industries as it was then. It enabled Gold Temp Industries to test the market, and it was a completely unknown market to them at that point of time. And, well, it's fair to say that it was sufficiently successful to have enabled GTI Aluminium to have traded to this point of time uh, in a profitable manner. Since the existing generating uh, lead generating system was established for Gold Temp Industries in the form of shopping centres, uh, the display of shopping centres were, which were producing leads for insulation, roofing and as well as that windows, it was uh, fairly simple to uh, simply set up an office, set up trading accounts with uh, suppliers of material and suppliers of aluminium windows and commence to sell contracts and install them. This particular uh, method commenced, uh, having been commenced, was continued on for some nine months into 1980 when it was envisaged that we would commence to actually manufacture ourselves, our own windows, um, somewhat substantially uh, increasing our profit uh, returns and enabling us to therefore re reinvest the money that we were earning at that point of time into new plant equipment, expanded administration, uh, and expanded facility for uh, all aspects of the operation, including development of brochures, standard sheets, and the like. It has proven to be fairly successful uh, to, to have commenced in this way, shall we say, virtually knife and fork, because it was enable, it enabled us to be able to control the operation very closely from day one until the time now where we in fact employ on subcontract and full wage some 27 people in all aspects of the marketplace and have been able very easily to establish ourselves a number two position. But it wasn't without having commenced a very firm, small, sound, tightly knit and well controlled operation that was small and grew step by step in a consolidated fashion. Um, and now we simply look with the uh, achievement of our recent Australian Design Award to further expansion of our capacity in the factory and generally to a successful, a continuing successful operation in what at this point of time is a relatively tight market. It isn't tight for us for one very good reason. A good reason is that our level of committed overhead is commensurate with a relatively low turnover for requirement to break even. So therefore we are able to take from the market at this point of time exactly what we need to achieve our sales and net profit levels uh, without having to overly stretch uh, our generation machine by way of advertising monies. I'll be now introducing to you 
our sales manager, Mr. Ray Bernard, who will continue on with various other aspects of our operation as it stands today. Yes, I'll be speaking on the purpose of sales meetings. In any sales organisation, especially in a direct selling business, the entire company is reliant on the dollar volume uh, coming through the door. The structure of the company, the number of employees who can afford to pay on wages, and the division of funds into the hundreds of expenditure channels all stems from an initial sales budget. Uh, this results in the necessity uh, of controlling and guiding the sales staff uh, to maximize their ability and to do it in the most economical uh, method to achieve the required results. To mo monitor the ongoing uh, sales targets and the methods of uh, attracting the budgets and also to attaining the budgets, need to meet on, uh, they need to meet on a regular basis in the form of a sales meeting. The objectives of a sales meeting are one, to see the week's uh, results and understand the requirements necessary for the following week. Two, explain any new product or method of sale of that product. Three, new price structures. Four, the ongoing advertising and leads that can be expected from the advertising. <coughs> Five, the management of any advertising drive. Six, discuss any problem areas that exist. Seven, share any known knowledge of the opposition activities. And eight, train or retain, uh, retrain product knowledge or sales methods. Nine, deal with any contentious points. Ten, and finally the tenth, motivate each other into new productivity. And it's essential for all members of the meeting to contribute in order to make a close sales team. Thank you. My name is Michael Cranston. The company that I represent is GTI Aluminium. I am a professional salesman. As a professional salesman, I must present both myself and my product in a professional manner. For this reason, it is important that I maintain a clean, neat and tidy appearance. It's important that I'm friendly and polite, but also that I'm businesslike in my approach to the client. It is necessary for me to be able to answer any questions that the client may put to me, therefore it is imperative that I have full knowledge of my product. As I'm engaged in the business of aluminium window replacement, it is necessary for me to present my window in a clean state and operating properly. It is important that during the presentation of the window that I go through every single feature and benefit of our product without drawing any comparisons between our window and any other manufacturer's window. It is necessary to explain to the client the manner in which the operation of replacing his window will take place <coughs> right from the administration side uh, through remeasuring down to the actual operation done by the installers. I believe that by conducting myself in a professional manner in my dealings with the client that I automatically convey to him the obvious professional and ethical way that this company operates. Thank you. My name is Tony Isles. I am a salesman with the company of GTI. The usages and customs amongst salesmen have never borne a near affinity to those of their opposition. We cooch our systems of learning and polity to be one of the best in South Australia. We use the means of a pitch book. The pitch book, you must understand that the customer really is looking for ideas. The customer is looking for examples. The customer is looking for credibility, design, the way we do our work. All this can be illustrated by the means of a pitch book. As you see, we have comprehensive drawings, photographs, uh, even a little article on the award. We have situations where 
windows are being cut out and doors placed in. We have different designs on corner windows, also the aesthetic view that maybe the bronze does to the white of a house. This is a very good selling point uh, because the, in, the interior of a house can change quite a bit as well as the exterior of a house, the aesthetic view and colouring. Here we have a new product which is a greenhouse window. This to begin with will be fitted to the kitchen window and uh, hopefully the rest of the house. As you can see, finally, we have recommendation letters uh, from thankful clients which go up and usually seal a sale. Good morning, my name is Bowden Jaworski and the subject that has been selected for me to discuss is uh, window closing situation. Um, in this type of um, present or situation, I find myself a little bit um, green. I um, found that um, the most important factor associated with closing a um, generally starts from the moment you meet the customer or the client, and the closing situation generally starts from that moment. You are working your way around to a situation where you can overcome all the client's uh, negative replies to your positive ans uh, um, questions. You are uh, working continually to try sell your product, sell yourself, sell the company, and virtually it's a package deal. In my early days here, I found that um, there were 10 recognised uh, formats for closing a sale. I think in the three months that I have been here, I have attempted uh, possibly three of those uh, closing techniques and I think I've found that two of them have been successful so I have virtually steered to two te techniques I haven't tried to be fancy in, in um, assuming that client, uh, clients are going to um, just ask for quotes I have gone in with a very open approach advise them of the price the product any problems that are associated with uh, their particular job and um, my basic format has been of an assumed close and that is the manner that I find that has been successful for me and I think you'll find with all closing situations it all depends on the person that is doing the selling what is suitable for, for that man. Morning, my name is Alan Furman, I, I'm a sales representative for GTI Aluminium. I'd like to present to you the uh, Rylock Aluminium window as manufactured by GTI it's the winner of two major awards from the Industrial Design Council of Australia, the Australian Design Award and the Design Selection Award. That is the horizontal sliding window model. As you can see, it has an extra wide external frame, 65 millimetres wide. The uh, profile of the outside, we have designed to break it down rather than having a flat, bland window frame. We have given it a picture frame profile, which makes the window very attractive you can now replace your existing windows without losing the character of your home. Uh, you'll notice the extra heavy duty centre mullion. Uh, that gives the window uh, extra strength, enormous wind resistance, and becomes a very durable window. Uh, we'll just turn that around where you can see the internal view. That's the inside of the window. You'll notice that all our corner joints are mitered as against butt jointed windows and this gives uh, a far better seal in the corners prevents leakage and seepage of water through. The sliding action is excellent. You can operate the window with a single finger and that is basically due to the fact we use a stainless steel ball bearing roller that provides a permanent free motion on the window. The sliding sash is removable. Sliding sash is removable for easy maintenance, easy cleaning. You can see the ball bearing roller there at the bottom. You'll also notice there is a mohair seal around every edge of the internal frame of the window, so that there is no metal-to-metal -metal contact whatsoever. You always get a nice tight closure, 
and uh, that you won't get any dust or draft or rattling of windows. Screens are removable from the inside, not externally, and this is an added safety feature. Let's pop that back. The locking system has a center latching system which locks automatically as you close the window. The security lock is a secondary optional locking system which locks the window in the fully closed position or in the <coughs> open position if you wish to lock your window and still leave the window part open. With the key locking system, it is still perfectly My secure. My name is Lee Brown. I'm the administration manager for GTI Aluminium, and some say that I am the hub of the company. I am the one that runs it. When one of our sales staff walks in with a contract, there are many things that ha it has to have on it. It has to be thoroughly scrutinised to make sure all the information that we need is on there. Take a typical pad like this. Working down from the top, we need a lead source and name, i.e. it could be Vivian from a shopping centre such as Andale. The window configuration must be clearly stated in here, whether it's got a transom or a transom height, the colour, the type of glass and if security locks are to be fitted. All these are necessary to make sure that we do the right thing from this end by the customer. All these points must be adhered to so that the contract can be done without any mistakes. The most important thing, however, uh, down the bottom, we want a customer signature and a 25% deposit over if it's over $1,000 and 10% under $1,000. If all these things are on this contract, we will put it out the front to be given a work number when it will be sent back to me and the whole contract will be processed. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Neil Hammond. I'm the production manager for GTI Aluminium Windows. GTI Aluminium Windows are manufactured by a small but a very experienced group of young men. Window production begins with what is called a cutting sheet which uh, has on it all the required details for any such windows to be manufactured, i.e. name of job, colour and configuration of windows, as well as a list of all the sizes of the components to be cut. This sheet is given to the machinist whose job is to A, check the quality and the film of the extrusion to be cut, B, to cut all the uh, extrusions to the required sizes and place them in a mobile trolley. Uh, from this trolley, the extrusions take two separate paths. One, uh, the sash components are taken by our sash maker who A, checks that uh, all the extrusion again is has a correct commel tone film on it. Uh, he then cuts all the um, sash extrusions for the locks, etc. Uh, B, then he screws all the frames together, checking that all the mice are flush and that there are no blemishes in the glass. The frame is taken from the trolley by a person who threads all the mohair and fits rubber and end caps to the mullions. This is then given to our frame assembler who has the very important job of making sure that the frames are screwed together with all sashes, uh, with all, sorry, with all mitres being flush and sealed and also putting drain holes to allow any water which may get in to get out again easily. He then uh, gives the uh, frame to the glazer who uh, fits the glass in a horizontal position whilst checking that the frame is square and there are no blemishes in the glass. The, uh, while this is all going on, the, uh, the screen maker has made all the screens required. These are then fitted together with the sashes in the frame and they are all checked over and on this final quality check they uh, are then fitted with a sticker which shows again yet another award winning roll up window has business is a business where disorganized chaos is the cause of running things effectively. Round about midnight the bakers begin to turn up in their sleepy fashion and they there's a delivery that is done early because of early shops opening and where in normal cases had they loaded their vans up in the normal time they probably wouldn't get to a lot of these shops until about 10 o'clock in the morning, which of course um, a lot of customers are waiting for their early morning bread, anything up to about 7 o'clock in the morning. 
Making the bread has to be very crucial because the amounts made uh, have to coincide with the amounts sold. Otherwise, there is a hell of a lot of wastage, and the loaves themselves, there's not much you can do with them other than sell them to um, pig farms or maybe the wildlife reserves. Now, the bread itself is mostly done by machine. It's extremely hot in the, uh, the bakehouse, and during the winter time, it's fairly comfortable, but you can imagine what the heat is like in the summertime. It is tremendous. And where the bakers are working, generally in shorts and singlets, um, and turning the dough to its various different shapes, whether they be making long loaves or round rolls, and the type of rolls also made are the sesame seed ones that is put on by hand or by shaker. 15 seconds. <laughs> Most of these sesame seeds, I'd like to finish up by saying, are wasted, uh, unfortunately, because during the course of putting on and by the time it gets to your table, it's dropping off all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, I certainly hope you enjoyed that little bit uh, about the bread industry. We'll continue at the next session. Good morning, fellow salespeople and others. We are here this morning to try and improve our image of ourselves and. Uh, I know that we've all been given a topic to, or haven't been given a topic to, we've decided ourselves what topic we're going to talk about, and all I'm going to say is that I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I have decided to discuss uh, or um, go over my experiences on the snowing landscapes. My one and only attempt at uh, skiing uh, happened about three years ago four years ago and uh, it was something that I thought I was quite confident at, as I normally am with most things that I attempt and the day when I uh, the day that I arrived on the snowing slopes in, in Melbourne um, was a very overcast afternoon and I uh, thought that I'd try and get a, a bit of practice in before the the next day's um, activities. So, game we were plotted on over to the Poma, which is the uh, little unit that proceeds to carry people physically up to the top of the hill, and uh, attempt my first run to the hill. Well, getting onto the Poma is an art in itself, because it doesn't react the way that one would imagine. One expects the, the unit to, uh, it's an item that you surround cylindrical thing that you put between them and you sort of are supposed to let the the idea of the art of the uh, exercise is not to take let the weight of the unit um, your tape take your body weight. The unit's supposed to just carry off up on your skis and up the top of the hill. So, as with everyone else, I included, the natural instinct is to sort of lean back and feel the strain, and there isn't any strain, because it's on an elastic band situation. So, uh, fortunately for myself, I was able to sort of bounce off my heels and keep my balance and struggle my way up to the slope, top of the slope, and uh, proceed my first run down the hill, which was completely obscured by the fact that there's cloud everywhere. In other words, I couldn't see down the bottom of the slope. So off I went merrily on my way, down my first second, my first slope, not realising that the idea of the, uh, of the game is not to go straight down, but to go zigzagging across down the slope. I proceeded to go charging down, hit one lump, two lump, and three lump, and splat. Right. <laughs> Following on from that very interesting discussion on snow, and also Tony's uh, brilliant talk about the bakery business, I'd like to sort of talk about something that sort of combines a little bit of both. Um, that's ice cream. Uh, the bakers sort of make little cones, and snow is very similar to ice, and I think Tony would know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Both he and I started our brilliant sales careers in the ice cream business, back in the cold climates of England, where you might imagine you don't sell terribly much ice cream but you'd be quite amazed to know the amounts of money that can be earned by a funny little man 
riding around the streets in a funny little van tickling his belt. And all these grubby little grippy-nosed children coming up to their hands with their pennies and sticking on top. Can I have ice cream, mister? And uh, it's quite an amazing art. If you can imagine this Italian machine where you pull a little handle and you balance five or six cones in there and you have to get this ice cream standing <laughs> and it's quite an art involved. There's quite a few little tricks of the trade that, that add to making this possible. Things like tossing in a bottle of ice cream soda to make the gear froth up a little bit more. Or, you know, <laughs> certain things that the health department don't seem to know about. And, um, it's quite an interesting way to pass the time, especially if you can imagine yourself up in the snowy mountains of Wales with four foot of snow around you and the families coming out from the shivering cold nights from the television saying, can I have an ice cream if that makes it too cold? <laughs> well, you know, you're sometimes amazed at that. Uh, and there's certain hazards to the job too, because there are laws in England which prevent you from ringing your little bell after seven o'clock at night. And of course your prime selling time in the business was between seven and ten o'clock in the evening, when everybody's sitting around the roaring log fires sweltering to death. And so, so you've got the added hazard of avoiding the local Bobby on his bike who comes along and says, Oi, what are you doing, mate, ringing your old bell? <laughs> and you get a $30 fine or £30 fine, I think it was in those days. We used to get good backing from the company. We used to say, well, if you don't get more than 10 fines a week, you pay half of them, you know. But even so, you had to sell quite an amount of ice cream to overcome the fines or have a good association with the local Bobby. Generally, chuck him at a Fortney chocolate bar or something halfway through the week and he'd look after you, okay? My God, I still got 30 seconds to talk. What else can you say about ice cream in 30 seconds? Well, it's one thing that it's an amazing business and you could very easily get licked if you didn't say anything. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I spent quite a considerable time last night trying to work out what I was going to speak on this morning and I thought well there's various aspects that I could speak on during my 43 years of life um, and I thought well there's things like um, farming in New Zealand and um, early morning mustering like getting up at two o'clock in the morning and catching a horse in the dark and going out in New Zealand that, um, like Rotorua and uh, Lake Taupo and some of the snow fields in New Zealand that would obviously interest Baden um, and um, various scenic attractions in New Zealand. But uh, I thought, well, there's not much point talking about those because all of you will be seeing that next year when you win the trip to uh, New Zealand. And, um, then I thought, well, perhaps I could talk about uh, the well, I started my selling career in Auckland, selling women's fashion wear door to door. But uh, that could be boring as well. And um, other aspects of my, like certain aspects of my sex life in, in Auckland. Michael. <laughs> <Cycle. laughs> yeah.
seconds to have thought about what I'm going to speak about. The best thing that came to mind was, as all of you spoke, was what, what was a high emotional point for my 37 years. I was on patrol one morning uh, in the city. It was Christmas Day, it was 1968. And um, on Christmas morning, really, you're expecting all the kids to be home and parents to be parents and the, the, the goodwill of the world to be pouring all over everybody. And you don't expect any trouble especially not when you've only graduated three months before and you're sitting there and in the first year that, that you're on the road you sit frozen waiting for the members of the public to ask you to apply every bit of law you've learned in three years and you just can't do it you know how to help old ladies over the road or stop a car and that's it the only other thing you're conscious of is that you've got this uniform and everybody attaches to you as being in high importance but to get on with the story because i've only got three minutes we're driving down Hindley street and the goodwill of the season was all over us and you've got no idea what it feels like to come across a hotel at 10 past 11 to find a brawl involving about 14 people and we're the only patrol car in the area. I promptly froze, looked for the pistol, couldn't find it and I thought, no, you can't use a pistol, they're using their fists. And I particularly noted a six foot 15 Italian standing with a one foot three Italian in his grasp, or literally, around the neck. And he had his head against a brick wall and was proceeding to break his nose. And I thought, What's going to go on here? Now, my senior man was a pretty sharp boy, and he all of a sudden slowed down. David, get your back now. I'm going to call in assistance. And his hand moved slowly to the speaker and picked it up. And he talked ever so slowly, so I started to get out of the car, slowly. There are about 14 guys all over the footpath, and this one big Italian turns around and looks at me. I put my hand, my hat on, my, my cap, and my hand was shaking. I pulled it back now. Have you ever felt what it feels like to walk it? 14 aggressive Greeks and Italians literally pounded the hell out of each other and you're walking across one at a time like this getting ready to, to apply the rule of law. I, I don't know why but I walked with the big Italian. They started to tumble a bit. One or two guys started out saying, oh don't worry, there's only two of them. I walked over, I grabbed the big Italian on the shoulder, I was nearly dead by this stage, and I went bop on the little fella's head. Not hard. The big Italian turned around to me and said I wanted to give myself up. That's exactly what he said. I went, hallelujah, brother. <laughs> and I took him up to the patrol car and spent all the time talking to him while the brawl was still going on. But luckily we had a lot of uh, support coming. There were about four or five patrol cars come. Italians and Greeks have a great deal of respect for the uniform. And so they all stopped. But I spent the rest of my time telling this big Italian, waving my back, never touched it. He would have killed me. He would have killed me. Just telling him what a bad boy he was. And he's hanging his head. And he's just saying, yes, I was. And he got into the patrol car. I never want to have to do that again. It's why I'm a salesman today. Thank you. <laughs> Good idea. Well, I thought that I'd speak a little bit about East Africa. I was there for 10 years, right up to the northern borders of uh, Kenya, bordering onto Somalia, Ethiopia, and uh, that uh, particular neighborhood. From Somalia, you had them coming down from Ethiopia, you got them through Sudan, coming into East Africa. They used to bring that stock and their cattle, and uh, it was very interesting to note the different types of people. But basically speaking, Africans are split into two racial groups. One is the Neolithic. He's the man who's got fairly angular nose and uh, sharp features of the Arab and also of the Egyptian. And uh, this feature is also brought about in, in the um, tribes further down south, like the Maasai. Then you have the opposite, which is the Bantu, He's the real Negroid of the uh, black uh, tribes, and he has the big nostrils, the heavy cheekbones, the jowls, and also the um, uh, areas right down to South Africa. And uh, the, um, the beauty about this is that you can distinguish them quite differently. Even the hair structure is different. Uh, the Neolithic has a straighter hair uh, structure than the, um, uh, than the Bantu. And also, they have very interesting, um, very, um, interesting lives and also laws that they have. Very strict laws, but uh, they are quite interesting. For example, at the age of 16, all the boys are circumcised. They're there for two years, as they call the Moran, or the actual leaders of the, um, of the tribe um, on, the, on the soldier side, if you like. They look after the tribe. They look after the uh, well-being of the tribe so that other tribes don't, don't fight. Uh, they are the soldiers. 
And during this period of two years, they are completely, uh, they don't do any work at all. All they do is strut around with their spears. The women also are circumcised. They have the um, clitoris cut so that they don't have any sexual feelings at all, so that they don't go to other men. And uh, this uh, is a very interesting uh, situation, albeit that the scarring that the tissues have cause a lot of um, problems with childbirth and also you have the, um, the problems of, uh, of tearing uh, during childbirth. I thought you'd be interested just to listen about a little bit of East Africa. They're 10 years. If you'd like to know more, I'll be happy to show you. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen and others. Um, you've all spoken on something you all know and enjoy. Um, I didn't realize what a wide variety of experiences we had sitting here in this room. It's such a large part of the world. It's all represented right here. It's an amazing collection. Um, I'd like to put in my two cents worth. I've been uh, to Greece, which is a, a remarkable place. And so many wonderful people there. You all speak sometimes so um, ooh, discouragingly about a lot of ethnic people, to not to call me French. Um, but I about nothing but warmth and friendliness from these people. Um, they went out of their way to make me feel welcome, to show me around, enjoy their own homeland with me. And it was as if they were discovering it all again through my eyes. You can't imagine what it's like climbing up a, an incredibly tall mountain with two young Greek people uh, and going through history in Byzantine churches and views that are so panoramic, you just, just can't imagine them. Uh, and fumbling with the camera you've only just bought, trying to record it all to show the people back home and cursing at yourself because you can't quite remember how to load the film and missing out, but storing it all the way so it comes back in your mind's eye so you don't really need a camera because it's always there. Um, going to Olympia, the place of history, the Olympics, um, trying to travel up there in a bus that breaks down, of course, as all Greek buses do, and tearing down a Greek mountainside in a taxi because if you miss the bus and you really have to catch that one because you have to catch the very next morning back to the island. And if you don't catch that bus, well, heck, you're stuck there for another week, you know, and uh, funds running low. So you sort of leap into a taxi, scream, follow that bus, you know, and roaring down a mountainside. And of course, all Greek drivers are kamikaze fellows. If you've lived in Melbourne, I'm sure you all know. And um, it's amazing. And of course, not having any money on me, I just said, look, I'll have to post you over a check. He said, no problem, love. I'm sure you'll, you, you'll do it. And so I'm stuck in the back of this taxi. And of course, we finally get on the big bus, and the bus roaring down this mountain so I just there going, oh, am I going to get some woman, please, mom, I want to come home, sort of thing. And this foghorn, of course, because it's getting dark at this stage, and this great big horn going, wah, 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 it's just sort of echoing down the mountainside. Um, I can't begin to explain to you all what it's like to be completely cut off from anybody else and to have to fend completely for yourself. It's an unbelievable sort of feeling. I hope I've shared with you. Thank you, John. Thank you once again for turning up to this uh, style of training meeting. We often ask ourselves the question, what the heck do we do at meetings? The question goes through our minds, meetings, meetings, and you've seen that, meetings, bloody meetings. However, I think we've got to take this in the form of context of what a meetings are for. First of all, they're formulated to serve a purpose. That purpose generally is to give us some idea of what our programming is for the next week, month, three months, 12 months. Now when it comes to sales training, we also look at ourselves such as the doctors do. The doctor goes through a procedure of five years medical training, he goes to, to a hospital, he does his internship, but that doesn't stop there. He doesn't say, hey, I've got a shingle on my door, I'm a doctor. He studies, studies, studies. Each year, every day perhaps, things change in the medical field. We are professional sales people, we are a professional sales body, so we have to understand that in our sales training, we have to keep up with the modern trends of the times. For instance, how does management know what is happening out in the field? With regards to opposition, we get feedback from new sales people here today. So as sales people, we've got to know all this. As management personnel of a company, we need to know that. We need to tell you people what we are planning to do. We need to know from you people what you want us to do. Now, if we don't have a meeting to do that, how do we find this out? 
So therefore, let's have a view, a look at sales training meetings as a meeting so we can all learn and in future developments of ourselves and our company. So therefore, if we take the attitude that we're not going to attend sales training meetings, we're not going to attend these things or contribute, then therefore we degress instead of, instead of progress. So to ask ourselves the questions, do we need to have a sales training meeting? We do. We ought to all attend and put our own piece into the company's point of view and put our here today to uh, learn a little bit about the Australian National Sport Squash. The Australian <laughs> National Sport. Some people may laugh. Okay, do people realise just the importance that uh, squash has played throughout uh, the Australian culture and the achievements that have been gained through players of this particular sport at Australian standards? Uh, we, we go through the current world champions. Uh, the current female champion is a, a young girl, Vicky Hoffman. Very close uh, relation, actually. She's doing quite well. Uh, going back some time ago, yes. Um, so you're not allowed to put some things on film, you know. <laughs> British Open, we have Heather Mackay, Blundell, number one, one minute gone, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Heather Mackay, Blundell, who's, uh, who's had uh, 13 consecutive world titles, the only person in the world to ever be able to achieve 13 consecutive <coughs> world titles at any sport, that is uh, an incredible achievement by any standards, and then we also look at Jeff Hunt with seven over the same period following up now with the uh, world junior champion Glenn Brumby, also from Adelaide. Uh, notice two South Australian people in the world championships. Very unusual at any sport and uh, such a competitive sport as squash. It's very unusual and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well done, Bill. <laughs> Go on, hang it out. <laughs> I want to say a few words about pipes. It's a very unusual subject. Usually it's on the stage now, eh? See, uh, one might say it's coming on the pipeline. <laughs> anyway, an uh, unusual story about pipes is, and I happen to smoke a pipe. A pipe is uh, one of those things you put in your mouth and puff great volumes of smoke out, and some people say that that smells beautiful, others say, for God's sake, put that damn thing out. <laughs> Particularly in sales meetings. <laughs> anyway, a uh, bit of a story about uh, <laughs> an experience with a pipe. Uh, some of the company, some of the lads, Lynn Lowen, uh, Dave Wilshire and uh, Dave's lad, we were up the Moe doing a little bit of fishing at one time. And uh, I had a particular pipe I was very proud of because uh, Dad had bought it for me for my birthday, you know, and uh, being an old pensioner, he paid $15 a new pipe, and, you know, I was uh, very uh, pleased to get it and uh, treasured it, so it was my best pipe. Anyway. We had a little uh, to do on the water's edge there and somebody got their fishing line tangled up. I casually wandered out into the water, fully dressed, <laughs> uh, stepped down a bit of a hole <laughs> in the uh, water, sank down below the uh, level and uh, <laughs> came to the surface minus one pipe, which I was very upset about gasping and carrying on. It was a very interesting little episode, and it, that may not sound it, but it was. Uh, nobody should, actually, nobody should ever smoke. Uh, it is very bad for you, and I shouldn't be talking on this subject at all. Ten uh, seconds to go. Ten seconds to go sounds brilliant. <laughs> but if you do smoke, smoke Borgham with a wonderful tobacco. <laughs> yep. yeah. Two weeks ago, Joe and I attended a computer course in Adelaide. First of all, I followed John, which was a bad idea because he never uses his indicators and the brake lights don't work from the car. <laughs> so we nearly didn't get there. We got lost and we finally arrived there about five minutes late, I think it was. And we walked into the college looking... Don't tell me it's not working. Yeah, it's working. Driving where to go and this guy came out here, a dirty old t-shirt on, shorts that he had, no, track suit, track suit holes in it. He said, you hit the computer course. And he looked like, what's his name, Peter Russell Clark. <laughs> so he went in there and we sat down in this small room. It was freezing cold. And John and I got this little seat in the corner. And he had to wear these name tags. You know, this guy comes out and he ends up being the lecturer. 
So he puts his name on the board, he says, oh, I'm so-and-so, and I'm here to talk about computers. He said, uh, but I've got a bit of a bad start because not many of you know about computers and I wanted to teach you how to program your computers. And none of us knew anything about them, so we couldn't program them. Anyway, on it went. People were getting bored and yawning and waiting for the lunch break to come along. And uh, finally it came four o'clock and the guy starts saying, at five o'clock we'll do this. And we thought we were going at four. So John put up his hand and he said, oh, look, excuse me, but I've got to go. And we walked out and six other people followed us. <laughs> the guy was left with an empty room. <laughs> Started on Monday afternoon. My son hurt his hand and he's been a sling all week. And as you and a lot of you know, he's a drummer. So how do you manage a one-handed drummer? So mother has to rush off and get a um, particular bandage to help support the hand. Then mother has to pack the drums, which isn't too bad, but she also has to pack the sound equipment, which is bigger and weighs about twice as much, but we managed to get it all up the hotel, which fortunately was locally. And uh, we met, we also, son is going out with the daughter of the house. And it was very busy on Friday night, so we do the right thing and we end up serving on the tables and we have a great night until very late in the evening and the drummer's hand packs up. So that was the end of that. So off we all just went home and left everything sitting there. Next morning, who has to pack the drums up? Mother. <laughs> who has to load them in the ute? Mother. Who has to get them home? Mother. Sunday afternoon, who has to unload the trailer full of iron off of the customer's roof? Mother. <laughs> so on go the old clothes, on go the special gloves, and off we go. Michael did manage to drive the ute, because I can't drive the ute anymore. And down we go with this great load of very old, rusted iron. But we don't only just have to unload it, we have to get it up into a tip truck. So there we have these great big long sheets of iron, some of them eight sheets long, trying to get them up with your hands. Has it gone off? No, no, you're off. <laughs> <laughs> so between us, there we are, up on the trailer and up on the, the truck with these very long sheets of iron, trying to load these up. And then everyone wonders why Mother has a sore back Saturday. <laughs> get home and Nigel says, oh look, just while you're there, can you throw a bucket of water in the cement mixer as you go past? Oh, well, we might as well, we've done everything else. Is there two minutes up yet? <laughs> we're getting close. <laughs> now, now just film on it for a long while. I'm filming now, son. Explain what it is because we've got the sound on as well. Oh, it's General Lee. It's General oh? Lee Dukes from Hazard. Dukes of Hazard. Today's date is Saturday the 4th of September 1982 and we're just coming to the Adelaide South Australia Royal Show. Would you like to say that again, Warren? Is that light flashing on and off on that camera, on that projector? Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm going to film here now. Uh, yeah?
Thank you, boss. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you got me last year. Do you have a new room, Colin, on your house? <laughs> You're on. <laughs> 